Hello everyone, my name is Gulchin. Today we are going to discuss with you how we can solve the marketplace supply shortage problem with the help of product. Before we move on with the topic, I'd like to give a very brief introduction of myself. Uh, currently, I'm working as a senior product manager at former eBay, New Adevinta. But before this, I've worked for the last eight and a half years in different tech companies, including Uber, Rocket Internet, etc. Uh, mostly focusing on the marketing previously and on the product management lately. So today we're going to uh, discover and explore what are the possibilities we can unlock with the help of product to help the market uh, supply shortage problem. But before we move on with the uh, discussion, I'd like also to refer again to the product development framework. As you know, most of us as the product managers, we have kind of a framework we need to follow to make sure that any product we build is successful. Where this uh, product development framework usually starts, first of all, with us discovering problem space, meaning that before we start working on anything, we need to make sure that we have a clear understanding of the problem. Uh, what's the problem size? What's the problem? What's the root cause of the problem causing it to happen? Who are experiencing this issue? What's the impact? What's the size of the impact in terms of revenue or other business metrics? Um, how frequently this problem occurs? Um, Etc. So all those questions and many more would give us a better understanding of the problem scope. And after we have a clear understanding of the problem scope, then we usually move forward with different phases, uh, starting with ideation. If we have already a clear understanding of the problem, then we move forward with exploring um, I, different ideas, how we can potentially solve this problem, also sharing it with internal and external stakeholders. After the ideation phase, if you already have a few wireframes or options, how we want to solve it, we move forward to design some um, demos or options, and then we start validating it with our uh, main customers to make sure that this idea we came forward with it would work for customers and would solve their problems. Without validation, we can never be sure that we are working on the right idea. And after we pass this phase, we usually continue with the development or launch phases. Um, but today, I wanted to once again highlight the importance of the problem discovery because it's a very important, very first step that everyone needs to take into consideration before jumping on the ideation or the solution phases. So if we are working on the undersupply uh, problem, it's very important for all of us to understand why we are supply constrained as a company. There might be several reasons, and some of those reasons might be, first of all, to start asking uh, your colleagues or yourself if this is an acquisition problem. Maybe we are undersupplied because we are not acquiring enough uh, suppliers. Or maybe we are not acquiring the right suppliers. We are acquiring the people, but they're not right fit based on our needs. Of course, those are the marketing questions, but you need to collaborate with all the departments if you are given um, a problem of undersupply and you are trying to solve it. So then you need also to check since when this is happening, why this is happening, if this is an acquisition problem. Is this a budget, budget problem? Uh, maybe you did some change with the budgeting lately, which impacted your undersupply problem. Or are there any supply limitations in the given area? Maybe uh, there was um, there were a limited number of the suppliers available in this area, and maybe you already reached, reached to this number. Therefore, you are unable now to extend it further. But what if it's not an acquisition problem? You double-checked all the lines and asked even more questions, did more analysis, and found out that none of those are um, causing your undersupply problem. Then the next question is to look into is, if there is a problem with the acquired supplies conversion rate to the next jobs, meaning that let's assume that you acquired um, a million people every month and then you start noticing that only one percent of those people converting to the next job while previously it was higher or historically it has been lower then the question is why 
why the minimum number of the people are converging to the next jobs, why this rate, conversion rate, is below the industry benchmarks or um, uh, your company benchmarks or market benchmarks you are operating in. What's happening there? Why people are not converting? Maybe it's a UI problem, or maybe there are more steps in the uh, sign-up funnel or a supplier funnel that's causing them not to convert to the next jobs. Or maybe they find some bugs, uh, experiencing certain challenges with a converting. So it's very important for you to discover if this is a conversion problem, and secondly, what's the reason causing it. But let's assume that it's also not a conversion problem. Then third group of the problems that may cause your undersupply situation can be average supply being um, not in, as engaged as you would like. For example, let's say that any supplier is providing um, monthly targeted number of the jobs. For example, uh, you expect a, an ordinary supplier for Amazon Flex to do at least uh, seven or 10 deliveries per day or 30 deliveries per week. But when you look into the schedules or track the data, you start noticing that uh, some proportion of your suppliers and the biggest proportion has dropped below this benchmark you have as a company wide. Then it means that your suppliers are not as engaged as you'd like. Jobs per user is dropping. Then it's very important to understand why this is happening. Maybe you can do an extensive research um, with your UX department, or you can do a survey, uh, or you can go and directly ask dozens and hundreds of people just to learn more what's causing this problem to occur, uh, which is a very important um, metric to keep an eye on. Uh, however, let's assume that none of those pr three problems are causing your undersupply issue. All of them are really healthy for your company. Then the next question you need to ask and validate if there is any retention problem in your company, meaning that your churn rate could be high or higher than usual. And again, when you compare it to different companies, competitors, businesses, um, market benchmarks, you might see that your churn rate is uh, quite high. It's above, for example, 15, 20%. Um, again, depending on your industry or depending on the markets you operate in. This might be a problem to um, investigate and understand why this churn happening, why people are churning. Maybe they're unhappy about their earnings or maybe your suppliers are unhappy with some procedures, um, with the level of customers, quality of the jobs they're receiving, or, or their in-app experience is faulty. So there might be dozens of reasons, but it's very important to understand if it's a churn problem, then why people are churning. And finally, uh, let's assume that none of those are happening, or maybe two or three of those problems might also uh, be occurring at the same time for your marketplace. It's also important for you to respond to the fifth group of the questions. Maybe any of the factors here could also potentially impacting, uh, could be impacting your supply situation, which is the seasonality and the holidays. For example, if it's um, a specific season and a holiday happening in the country, it's more likely that your market or one, one or more of the markets are going to have the differentiated spikes or um, a, a sudden uh, change in the graphs for certain metrics, including supply availability. Another important factor is any change in the competition landscape can also impact your supply situation. For example, even when the competitor is doing the price increase, price decrease, or new competition is coming to the market, or existing competitor is leaving the market, it all might change your supply situation. So it's important to keep an eye um, on it and uh, double check, verify it whenever you are investigating your undersupply problem. Um, the third and the fourth factors is that if there is any change in the com company legislations, internal procedures or governmental legislations in regards to your supply situation, it might also impact your suppliers. For example, if you recently started to acquire new document from the suppliers, new ID check or um, any other validation, then 
because government asked you to do so, then most likely you are going to lose certain proportion of the suppliers in the funnel or their existing suppliers might also leave because they didn't have this document before. Unfortunately, those changes that you are driving internally, they need to be discussed ahead. And if those happening, then you are most likely going to uh, experience a churn or lose certain proportion of your supplier, existing supply. Basically, those are some of the problems that might cause undersupply issues. But again, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you are undersupplied, it's caused one of definitely caused one of those um, problems. However, those are the most frequent problem types causing undersupply issue. Now let's assume that you already made your discovery and you have a clear understanding of what's causing your uh, supply uh, number of the suppliers to drop. If you already have this clear overview of the problem space, then you are good to move to the next product development phases, which starts with the ideation. Now that we know the problem, let's start thinking how we can potentially solve this problem. Here, I'm going to give you some examples based on the hypothetical problems we discussed. But again, those are the potential solutions on the ideation phase. Doesn't mean that those are the right solutions for, the, for your company or for your business. Uh, you always need to deep dive into the problem uh, discovery, problem root cause, understanding it, and then finding the right solution which works best for your customers. But for some of the cases, I can share um, ideas that might work for bringing more supply into your platform or engaging your existing supply more. Let's start with the first problem group, which was an acquisition. So let's say that the problem was that we are not able to acquire enough supply at a targeted value. This means that we have enough budget, but we don't want to spend more on the suppliers than we should Given that we have ROI target, we always want to spend less than we expect to learn from those suppliers. Therefore, there is always a budget uh, marketing teams prefer to stand within. And given the situation, if we have the uh, limited resources or limited channels, you might think of bringing new acquisition channels on the board with the help of product. One of those channels is a referral channel. For example, in Lyft, uh, Lyft is one of the companies which uses referral channel where you can go and refer different drivers. And as a driver, if you refer a friend to drive with them, um, then if your friend completes a certain goal within the given period, for example, within the 19 days, if your friend completes 295 rides, then you'll get $350. This is a friend referral program and works in the terms that the company has set for itself, which knows that the company is going to be ROA positive if this goal is hit. But before you start building the referral channel, you need to take into consideration several factors. One of those important factors is the finance. So you need to make sure that whatever budget you set for your referrals, it must be within the company caps, it needs to take into consideration uh, the caps where you would still be ROI positive uh, from the marketing and the product perspective. Also, uh, you need to make a few decisions about what type of a referral campaign you need to build. For example, you can build a campaign where only referring person would be re rewarded. Or both parties, both referrer and the referring person, uh, referred person, sorry, would be rewarded in the end. This is usually the most popular one where both parties are rewarded because then both parties feel engaged and they want also to try the platform. They are keen, they have a goal, financial goal to achieve the results. The third part, uh, third type of the referral campaigns is when only one party, but referred person are, is being rewarded. It's it's the least preferred one because usually you need to motivate the referring person to refer the friends. However, if only referred person is being rewarded, then referrer is less likely to feel engaged to participate in the program. And finally, there might be some referral programs where none of the parties are rewarded. This is also happening sometimes, especially when um, some companies, they know that they already have uh, valuable enough uh, acquisition streams. They just open the channel for inviting your friends, but uh, they don't uh, position it as a referral channel. 
you still have the functionality to invite friends to the platform to let them use it. However, it's not a referral program because none of the parties have any benefits of referring other person. Another important decision you need to take into consideration when building a referral program is referral value. So what benefit do you want to give to the referring and the referred people? There are a few options without deep diving into um, financial value of those selections. The, for example, you can uh, reward them with cash. It can be in credits or in balance. Um, most of the companies are using this option because cash is the most uh, engaging, has been proven uh, one of the most engaging tools in referral programs for the last decade. However, some of the companies also prefer using freemiums and free product up upgrades, uh, especially for referring parties. For example, you might see in um, internet companies, they are doing it really often. If you bring a friend on the board, then you get one month of free internet. Uh, another uh, value type for referral campaigns can be selective benefits. It's when you have two or three options of different benefits available for the referring or referred person, but you let them select out of those options or pool of options that you have. Um, so they get the chance of selecting, which is also one of the elements customers really like. And finally, the, uh, the fourth type of referral benefits can be uh, a chance of participating in the competition. You can run the referral campaign, but you can tell that with referring each friend, for example, you will earn certain points. And in the end of each month, um, based on your points, you will get the chance to participate in the competition where you can earn something big. Here, you, you know that it's a game of chance, but uh, some companies still prefer using this option. Uh, however, there is no data whether it's uh, engaging or not. It needs to be tested. Basically, those are all the um, referral channel ideas. Uh, however, there is also another important acquisition channel which has proven to work really well for uh, supplier acquisition or gen in generally for user acquisition, which is called enablers. It's when you create as a company or as a product, you build new B2B portal for enablers. You onboard active partner organizations who can build their businesses on top of your business to engage new supply and they earn money out of it. Uh, for example, one of the good examples that I really like is Uber. Uber has built an Uber fleet platform. This is a platform where if I'm a car company or I have and if I have, for example, dozens of cars or hundreds of cars, I can just uh, register my company there and my cars. And then I can hire drivers myself on a fixed rate or stable rate, totally depends on me as a, a car uh, park owner. And then I would register them in the platform, which is called Uber Fleet for Uber B2B uh, enablers. And then they would... Uh, monitor their employees, they would bring more people on the board because they have more cars, and then they would train them, they would earn money out of it, and they would be arranging the payments themselves. So as a company, Uber is winning the, an optionality here to, um, to skip the uh, user acquisition and to skip the user training parts because enablers are already doing it as they are building their own businesses on top of existing platform. So with enabling this new channel, companies may uh, save some time and some resources from bringing the suppliers themselves. Instead, they bring the companies and the partners on the board who are going actively to work on bringing new suppliers. This might be one of the bad valuable channels. Now about the conversion problem. Uh, so let's say that uh, we want to solve conversion, some of the conversion problems, because our acquired supply doesn't convert to the next first or until the 10th jobs, which means that if this is the funnel you have, uh, let's assume that people come, they sign up, then they get their account activated if they have all the documentations in place. Then you expect them to download an app to start working. They receive the first request, they accept it, then they start completing the jobs first until the 10th one. So you usually want in a healthy funnel 
uh, job completion rates to grow after the first job, or you also expect to sign up to first job conversions to be really high. But if you, in your funnel, you start noticing that somewhere you have huge dropouts um, in different phases, then definitely in the product discovery phase, you should have already investigated the root cause of it, why people are uh, lost somewhere in those funnel and why this proportion is so high, what's causing people to leave. Let's say that you already have some ideas why this is happening. For example, one of the ways, um, if uh, one of the problems, if people are lost in the funnel is because app is too complicated to navigate within, then you might come up with a solution of showing them in-app education when they sign up first. Um, for example, this is an um, this is from uh, one of the apps in the internet where you can see step by step what's happening when you sign up to the platform so you can understand how this platform is working. This can also be done for your suppliers to make sure you save time on training and you move the training phase into the app directly. Besides that, if people are failing to move through the conversion funnel, you need also to double check your existing processes and existing UI. Maybe there is something in the UI side that makes uh, people to feel challenged and they don't know what to do next or they feel it, um, it seems a very complicated uh, thing to use your uh, product and that's why they are leaving. If you find out any of those barriers and you know why this is happening in the discovery process, then here in the solution phase, it's very important for you as a product manager to come up with uh, certain solutions to make improvements in the UI and at least to experiment those solutions to see if this is uh, changing the conversion funnel to the positive. The third group of problems are churn related problems. So let's say that your supply situation is worsening because your turn rate is really high. Uh, the suppliers that you are acquiring and they're converting to the next jobs, they're gone after a certain period. And you wonder uh, how you can potentially solve this problem. Probably you already made um, follow-up discovery and you talk to your suppliers and you have enough information why people are churning. One of the churn reasons might be because people um, think they're not earning enough in your platform. So there might be two different situations here. First of all, if people are really not earning enough on your platform or they are earning money, but they don't have a visibility on it. Because when uh, users don't have a visibility on their earnings, they assume that they are not earning enough and they start complaining. So it's very important to show the visibility on the earnings so your suppliers would be um, happy and be keen and motivated to see their earnings so they wouldn't be churning often. This is at least an idea verse to, to be experimented. For example, in Uber, each driver can see their weekly earnings, they can see their um, the graphic of their weekly earnings and how it has been changing, and they can also see some basic statistics to relate to. Another um, important challenge for drivers or for suppliers, sorry, to churn might be because they don't know how they can potentially earn more money. If suppliers are keen to earn more money in your platform, uh, you can do in-app education potentially to help them to earn more. And this might be one of the ways to experiment and see whether it would be impacting your churn rate or not. Sometimes they just think that it's not possible to increase their earnings and they uh, try to look out different ways or to move to competition for increasing their earnings. And earnings is usually one of the most important factors impacting suppliers' uh, situation with two-sided marketplaces, especially in their real-time ride-sharing companies. Um, another problem causing the retention issues might be your suppliers, and again, related to the earnings, uh, they might think that they're not um, receiving enough job requests or they're not in receiving enough customer requests so they can earn more. This might be caused from different problems, but first of all, you need also to double check and verify that your search or matching algorithms are performing really well. Uh, those are the algorithms companies such as Amazon, uh, Lyft or Uber has to make sure that customer gets their requests done. For example, when you search in Amazon for any keyword, 
uh, the search algorithm is ranking all the results based on your criteria and also based on different criteria, market-based or uh, based on the popularity, uh, quality, etc. And then it's trying to show the best results for your search on top of the page. Uh, similarly to Amazon search algorithms, for example, uh, Lyfts or Uber's matching algorithms are trying to look for drivers whenever you are searching for a driver um, based on the location and also based on the quality for their rating, etc., to make sure that you are matched with the best and the quickest possible um, nearby driver. So those algorithms are, uh, are the basis for the success of those companies and the products. Therefore, as a product manager, if you want to double check your retention rate or to improve your churn rate and make your uh, suppliers happy, you need to make sure that those algorithms are working really well and they're fair towards to suppliers. Of course, you need to um, validate and double check and there might be no uh, bugs on these platforms, uh, on, in these algorithms, but it's not enough just to maintain those. You need to make sure that you have a team always working and improving search and matching algorithms because you cannot just build it once and leave there because it, it can get outdated. As your business is growing, the more cases you are experiencing, the newer rules you need to bring uh, into those algorithms or new technology you need to bring in um, and, uh, that you don't want to miss. If you don't uh, keep improving the search or matching algorithms, one day you might be super outdated and your suppliers might just leave because they're not getting really enough jobs. Or there are some use cases you are not covering with the help of the rules that's going to cause your business eventually fail. Therefore, it's very important to validate if everything is working right uh, with those algorithms and then making sure you keep improving those based on the feedbacks. You always validate and double check if um, there is anything that needs to be improved here. Then the next thing that might help with the um, supplier retention and to make sure you can help them to earn more is smart pricing strategy. So we talked that one of the most important reasons for suppliers to churn is related to their earnings. And one way of improving their earnings can be improving your pricing strategy. Of course, pricing strategy can sometimes not fall into product management area, but sometimes it does because there are so many things we can do with the pricing as product managers. Um, as you know, there is always a base pricing. It's a basic way of how price for your product is being calculated. But there are also different pricing strategies. One of them is dynamic or search pricing. The way how dynamic pricing works is that depending on the seasonality, on the demand and supply situation in a specific period of time, uh, you can set in um, a, an algorithm which is going to define your, your pricing, uh, estimating how much demand or supply you are getting, and it's going to show different prices for different uh, timings. And again, dynamic pricing or search pricing in the ways that we know from uh, different companies, it's taking into consideration all the market specific characteristics. So it uses real time data, sometimes also the future data to understand if there is enough supply for the demand. And in case if there is less supply available for the increased demand, then it's going to automatically be uh, increasing the price. When the price is increased, it's expected uh, demand to decrease. And when the demand is decreasing, then the marketplace equilibrium is happening, meaning that there is enough demand to and supply to meet with each other. Uh, this is why dynamic pricing is being used. However, we also need to be careful with dynamic pricing. There needs to be the highest caps and the minimum caps to make sure that it, it doesn't keep growing all the time and it doesn't hit the unbelievable numbers for the marketplaces. But it's usually preferred because especially during the holidays, the peak hours, when um, there is a uh, there are going to be high demand or higher than expected, then those are the times when dynamic pricing might help to decrease the demand so the suppliers would get enough jobs and customers wouldn't get dissatisfied. Uh, at the same time, it's uh, valuable because it's increasing the supplier's earnings and they're getting more money from the jobs they would get within the normal hours. There is another pricing strategy that might potentially help 
uh, to increase the supplier's earnings, which is called personalized pricing. So suppliers might earn more when we charge customers more, but of course, our aim is never to charge customers more. Our aim is to make sure that there is enough supply in the marketplace to meet the demand. With personalized pricing, we show different prices for each customer. Uh, taking into consideration user-specific details, for example, sometimes the uh, web browser customer using, the device customer using, or a historical data of customers' behavior, locations customer traveled, we can estimate whether this customer can pay higher or less amounts for the uh, given product or a given service. And then we can uh, create a user-based pricing, personalized pricing for this user and charge users differently. Uh, we need also to be careful with personalized pricing because there are some ethical and uh, legal questions. We need to double check and make sure that we, we are operating within this frame. However, it's also one of the ways that uh, can improve the pricing strategy in a smarter way to make sure we have enough suppliers to meet the demand, not to just dissatisfy customers. And at the same time, to make sure we help with the uh, uh, supplier earnings so they don't churn. One of the best ways of predicting, uh, preventing churn is to predict the churn before it happens. So it's really the smartest way. First of all, we um, in most of the companies, we already have churn prediction algorithms in place, meaning that we have uh, we can estimate any user's probability of being churned before this user is churning. And depending on the probabilities, we can target those users with different communications or with different benefits and then prevent them from churning. With this, we can... Um, decrease our churn rate as it's easier to resurrect churned people before they churn rather than later. And finally, uh, one of the churn reasons can always be product related. We always need to take into consideration that maybe there are some uh, barriers on the UI side or there is a buggish experience for users that's, that are causing them to uh, churn. And if this is one of the problems that you validated during the discovery phase, probably uh, you need to work improving UI to make sure that uh, users don't leave the platform. And finally, uh, the last problem is the engagement problem. As we discussed earlier, sometimes job, jobs per user is lower than expected. So we want active supplier to be very engaged and also very dedicated to the product. We want them to complete at least X number of the jobs within the week or within months. However, if they are performing less than expected, for example, if they're doing only single or two jobs per month on average, then there are certain ways with the help of the product, we can incentivize them to change their behaviors. Changing user behavior is not easy, but it's very much possible with the help of product. For example, one of the ways we can use is incentives or reward programs. Um, incentives are really easier way of changing user behavior. We can just say suppliers, uh, give them some targets and say that do X to get Y. So do certain uh, activities, for example, complete X number of the trips to earn $200 by the end of the week. So those are the how incentives work. Sometimes you can make it uh, smarter, automated, et cetera, which is going to make it um, easier to manage. And another way of it is reward programs, where you set some kind of a gamification or more engaging way of uh, working with your suppliers to make sure they get uh, engaged with your platform, they become more loyal, and then uh, they start working towards the goals on a monthly basis so they can reach out to the targets for the company. But there are different types of reward program types. Uh, for example, there are perks. Uh, sometimes uh, supermarkets are really uh, loving this way of working. They give users some benefits with every single shopping that they are making. It's called perk, and it's a reward for each purchase. Then there are programs such as Earn and Burn. With every single shopping, you get some kind of a point uh, or discount that you can use in the next shopping where you burn it. Uh, another way of uh, reward program types is tiered programs. Uh, this is where you assign different levels to the users. 
You can say that, for example, you're a gold, diamond, platinum, etc. And then depending on those levels, you can give them different uh, goals or different uh, reward types. Fourth type of the reward programs is gamifications. And this is the favorite, my favorite way of engaging existing suppliers or any type of users because gamifications is usually making it fun, uh, making it more engaging for the users, assigning them ba badges, making smart goals, uh, dynamic goals, etc. Um, and the fifth way of fifth type of reward programs are hybrid programs, meaning that you can merge two or three of the above versions, above program types into one and build a hybrid type of program. Uh, there are some criteria for reward programs. It's very important to take them into consideration if you are building one. The very first criteria is from the product side and from the UI side to make sure that your reward program is easy to use and it's easy to understand. Uh, of course, when building a reward program and deciding on what the reward should be, you're going through multiple compl complicated um, processes of uh, agreeing on the financial part, agreeing on the budget, making sure the budget you spend per each supplier is within your profitability cap, meaning that it's um, it's ROI positive. Uh, you take into consideration all the uh, future predictions, financial predictions, behavioral predictions, and uh, you keep validating yourself. Uh, so it's very important to make sure that when you build and you, when you agree on those benefits or when you agree on the terms, they are not complicated and they're going to be easy to use and make it easy for others to join and use this program. Second important part is to make sure that the reward you are giving in the end of program is very relevant for the users. So this part also re requires a lot of research pre-work to be, to be done before launching the program itself. So you need to make sure that any benefit people are going to get out of this program is going to be relevant for them. It's important for their day-to-day -day lives, jobs, etc. So for example, you cannot um, give a manicure service for the Uber driver, right, as a benefit if there is a reward program for them. You really need to make sure that this is what they would be using on their day-to-day -day lives and relevant for them. And the third criteria is to make sure that the reward program you are building is real time, meaning that any behavior uh, users are doing or suppliers are going to show in your platform are going to be automatically uh, reflected on their performances in a way that they can see it somewhere inside app. This is one of the most important criteria based on the research made on reward programs that users would want to have uh, for the reward program to succeed. And finally, it's very important that this program is trustable. Users uh, are going to churn and leave your platform if, uh, the, if they win anything and they don't get it in the given promised period. Or if they're communicated something inside the product, but it doesn't happen in the end of the month. So this is something we need to avoid to make sure that we establish trust with our users and um, they feel safe within this program. Uh, I want to share one of the examples, uh, one of the companies that are using uh, gamifications as a reward program type. For example, this is Uber. Uber has built Uber Pro uh, reward program for the drivers. Drivers here can uh, needs to hit different goals to fall into one of the tiers, which is gold, platinum, and the diamond. Uh, for example, with every single trip they complete or depending on their cancellation rates and many other factors, they earn points. And based on those points, they can fall into one of those um, tiers. Uh, the program that Uber is using is more likely to be a hybrid one because there are tiers there there are game, and there is a gamification inside. So it might be considered potentially a hybrid program in my opinion. And here, for example, uh, you can see the badges and badges and the uh, goals, how it's being communicated inside an Uber app for drivers. Each time people are uh, earning the points, they're going to see how much more left. And then um, with those, they can always unlock the very next level and earn more. So basically, this is type of the gamification you can also use for your suppliers in the platform to get them to complete more jobs within the month 
to earn more points and to unlock more earnings for themselves. Another way of increasing the supplier engagement, let's assume that if this is the maximum suppliers can do, they cannot complete more than 10 jobs per week, but you want them to do 11th within the given time frame, then you need to think uh, some of the ways that can help them to optimize existing situation. How can you optimize existing supply? Um, let's say that any supplier can, uh, if any supplier can provide only 10 jobs in, a, in an hour, why not to take the 11th job in a queue and let the customer know that this job is going to be completed not within the hour they wish, but within the hour you suggest them, which is going to be a little bit later. For example, there are food delivery companies, market shopping, um, grocery delivery companies in Turkey. This is one of the screenshots I got from, from the app called Stegelsin. Here inside the app, if you are um, searching for a product and you want it to be delivered for your home, then you can schedule it for any time, which, which is uh, offered to you depending on the supply availability. So you can also make sometimes a real-time orders, but here, because the supply is not going to be available for that kind of a late night hours, they give you one hour gap instead of saying that's going to be delivered for sure within 10 minutes after you request it. So basically, uh, the customer's expectations are being managed. Existing supplies uh, optimization is happening because supplier knows that the job doesn't need to be completed right now, but the job can be taken into queue and completed after each other within the suggested time frame. This is one of the ways that can be used for optimizing existing supply. And in the end, I want to highlight one of the things that Karl Marx said about the supply and demand situation. Um, Supply and demand constantly determine the prices of the commodities, but they never balance and only constantly. And this is true. But the cost of the production for its part determines the oscillations of supply and demand. Here are the three most important highlights from the days that I'd like everyone to make. Is First of all, demand and supply problems are going to be ongoing challenges for most of the businesses. Um, but you should always start with a problem discovery as a product manager to make sure that you understand the problem space before you jump into the solutions. And finally, to solve this undersupply problem, you need to use the relevant tool to improve the situation and always validate this tool, testing your ideas and then measuring the impact with the right people or right, right customers or with the help of right metrics. Well, thank you, everyone. Please feel free to reach out to me through LinkedIn if you have any follow-up questions, but I'll be happy to connect with you. Thanks a lot.